Hi, I'm James Seed of the Eid Foundation, but you can call me Jim. And this is The Chess Files. The answers are out there. But a little bit about me. Who am I? I'm a chess player, first and foremost. I started out when I was pretty young, 15 years of age. I played my first tournament game in 1972. And no bonus points for guessing why I got involved in chess, who got me involved in chess, and why I fell in love with chess. And it was one of those times where it was a Fisher boom of generation of players my age. Um, and some of them got to be really good, much to my chagrin. But in any case, I was pretty young when I started winning adult tournaments. And I got uh, pretty good. I got became an FM. And what's an FM? An FM is good enough to fight with grandmasters, but not a good enough to become one. So I turned my attention to other things. And I got involved in organizing Grandmaster, International Master Norm tournaments, Speed A Futurities, things like that. I was president of a chess trust for about 10 years. I was on the trust for 20. Uh, and I did a lot of things like writing about chess. I wrote Chess for Dummies, which was published in 1996 and is still in print today. Um, it's in its fourth edition. But that's kind of enough about me. Uh, what about the Eat Foundation? The Eat Foundation is dedicated to building communities through chess. And we provide resources to those who do not have the resources to build a community through chess by themselves. So we do this in a lot of different countries. And I had my producer, who's really a great producer, uh, mock up this for me. This, these are the countries that we're in, and we're still just getting started. And, uh, you know, we've done uh, programs coast to coast in the United States, uh, several in Africa, um, and we're expanding our reach as we speak. I, I have a, I do not have a photo evidence that we're in uh, Lebanon now, but uh, uh, we have sent equipment to Lebanon, and hopefully I'll have a photo of that in the future. But, uh, you know, Zambia, uh, Uganda, these are the types of things that we um, do. And sometimes the reward is just unbelievably precious, too precious to imagine. You get a happy birthday uh, photo from uh, the players that little kids that you're helping to, to play chess. And uh, one of the players told me that uh, when the kids start playing chess, they stop crying because their, their concern is getting a meal that day not you know but chess takes your mind off it that's one of the wonderful things about chess the other things we do we we help senior centers and we help uh chess people uh in scholastics people that are basically trying to do um uh anything for kids so we're always doing that kind of thing and we also support um chess excellence so we've done the northern california um the chess uh, invitational we've done things like that and we also support uh, some research projects, like uh, we have the Arthur Award, which is named after my dad, and he taught me the game of chess. And uh, in his memory, I produced an award of $1,000 to the best essay that is consistent with the E Foundation's mission and uh, vision. And uh, last year's winner was Alexi Root of UT Dallas. She's doing a research project on the history of the women's US championships. And uh, I'm really eager to await this. McFarland is going to be her publisher. And uh, I think it's going to be a really good deal. We're happy to be supporting it. Um, and you know, one of the things we do, we have a website that you can see the scroll across the bottom of the screen. And I just wanted to point out that uh, we won an award. Holy smokes, this is the first year of eligibility for this award. We won for the best overall chess website. So I'm bragging about myself because I'm going to bring on a guest now who's got more awards than I did. And I think that uh, I want to talk about chess clubs. Are chess clubs going the, on, going the way of the buggy whip and are no longer important because everyone's playing chess online now? Or is there something we can do to help chess clubs be the backbone of chess in the United States and maybe around the world, who knows? So I'm gonna bring on another guy uh, that you may have heard of because he's been winning all sorts of awards. It's really bummed me out. Abel <laughs> Elementes. Oh, thank you for joining me. Yeah, oh. thanks. thank you for having me on. Well, I, I have to, and I've already <laughs> talked about you, I have to show a picture of you with your latest award, which is this award? <laughs> that was uh, the 2021 U.S. Chess Organizer of the Year Award. 
organizer of the year. Yeah. So you you make it sound like I have like several awards. I, I think I won two. <laughs> except well, except I won them in consecutive years because I got the that's 2020 right. accessibility yeah. and special circumstances. Oh, and I went to the US Open, which was in Cherry Hill, just outside Philadelphia this year. And it was um earlier this month. And uh it was like the Abel show. Abel's Abel, Abel. I got so sick of it because he was getting this award and you were, you were, aren't you the chairperson of the club committee? Yeah. So I'll, I'll be the incoming okay. uh, chairperson of the U.S. Chess uh, Clubs Committee, uh, taking it over from uh, Judith Starry, uh, who was the uh, chair uh, before that, uh, did an amazing job. Shout out to Judith. Yeah. A big time shout out. Uh, sort of rally that committee up to uh, update the uh, uh, guide to starting a successful chess club, uh, which was, you know, a document that was, you know, decades old and sort of revamped it for the modern age, uh, took the lead in that, delegated a few of us to work on updating certain parts. Uh, I have to give a shout out to, uh, you know, the, the members of the committee uh, that worked on it. Uh, Paul Covington was, was a huge part of that as well. Paul's um, a good guy. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, Judith's on other committees. She's the vice chair of the uh, accessibility and special circumstances. And she's on the prestigious Scholastic Council. Uh, right. One of, I, I believe, six members uh, that basically do all the policy for Scholastic Chess. Uh, in That's the a big States. job. So, yeah. so kind of. I've had um, Sarah Montreal before yes. and Neil uh, yeah. is another guy I'm very jealous of. He gets a lot of awards too. <laughs> he does, he does. And we got to hang out with him uh, at the US Open. But uh, yeah. so I'm sort of uh, taking this over, sort of alleviating some of the, the work uh, off of Judith. Um, and then uh, coming and, you know, deliver my own perspective uh, on the club's committee uh, and moving forward. She's still on the committee. Uh, so she'll, she's, you know, still going to, be a huge part of everything we do. Uh, but uh, I'm taking some stuff off of her plate and then uh, trying to put my own little spin on it. Well, Abel, I also, among the many times I saw you and um, uh, had to uh, applaud for you getting an award and that sort of thing, um, I saw a, a cross table with your name on it too. <laughs> so you actually played. I did. You know, and the, the funny thing about that is I, I went down, I, I never played a U.S. Open. And for those that don't know, uh, I sort of started my chess playing when I was around 12. Um, and then by like 15, I was one of the top ranked junior players in the country. Uh, I got to 2000 rating. Um, but you know, in, I played all the local tournaments in the Bay area. I did Lira and Francisco Sierra's tournaments and you know, oh, all, sure. all those. Yeah. And I'm, I know you're Jim familiar. Hurt at Lira. Jim uh, Hurt. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All the organizers, yeah. Peter Yu right, and all the stuff he did. Peter Yu. Um, shout out to Peter Yu. I actually, actually, shout out. I've recently reconnected with him. Uh, he was one of the only chess teachers I ever had. And I remember he was a student at, uh, Bellarmine college prep in San Jose. Uh-huh. Uh, my son ended up going to Bellman College Prep, which is kind of like an interesting thing. But uh, we've sort of reconnected, so uh, hopefully we get to see each other uh, pretty soon. But but anyway, yeah. just through all those uh, tournaments and all the playing I did, I never participated in the U.S. Open. So uh, when I was at Cherry Hill, I said, you know, I, maybe I should just play a few rounds if I can. Uh, and then I could say I played a U.S. Open, and I remember I went down to the registration table. That's uh, the same time I ran into you when you were checking in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then when I, said, I was losing my credentials, yeah, yes. <laughs> I, you know, just 30 seconds after receiving them. And then, uh, you know, and I said, you know, I, I want to play, but I can only play a few rounds. Cause you know, we have the delegates meeting and I have like the awards and, you know, the entry fee was like 200 bucks. Right. So even if I wanted to play, you know, three or four rounds, it was like 200 bucks. And then, uh, uh, she goes, well, you know, we do have quads if you want to play. And I said, what's the time control? They're all G30, uh, five delay. I said, all right, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I didn't even know I was going to be playing in a quad. And so, so I registered and, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm 1800 rating. I'm at my floor. And, uh, so I signed up for the quad and, you know, I, there's a 2200, uh, a 2000, there's me. And then there's like a 1750. So, and I remember right before I was going to start, I, I saw you in the hallway. I said, you know, my goal is to get a half point. If I can get a half uh -huh. point yeah, right, right. And, and, and not because of a buy, that would be great. Right. Yeah. Earn it. Yeah. Yeah. 
And you managed to get the half point, right? I, I, yeah, There's, I got that. Is, is I, there a story behind that? Yeah, so I got that half point in spectacular fashion. I, I'm actually, uh, you know, I, I was fine with the way I played. I lost to the 2200 in the first round, uh, yeah. but I, I liked the way I played. So in the second round, I was playing the 1750 player, and uh, I, I was I was totally winning that game. You know, I was up a couple of pawns. Uh, there, there was no complexity to the position. And then, you know, I started to run into some time trouble and then got to a point in the game where, like, I felt I was winning, where um, I, I was up a bishop for a couple of pawns. And I thought I was going to be able to uh, box my opponent into the corner where the king wouldn't be able to get out. And I'd be able to maneuver my bishop and, you know, just be able to win the game. But, you know, I was down to, like, 10 seconds left. Uh, I was looking at the position and, I, and I'm, like, I'm looking at the clock more than I'm looking at the board. And, right. <laughs> you know, and I felt like I couldn't make progress and I, I certainly didn't want to lose the game on time. So it just repeated three times, offered a draw. I took it. And then Adam Porth, who's the president of the Idaho Chess Association, he was, oh, the, yeah. Tur yeah. He was the tournament director and he was uh -huh. watching the game. And then he goes, couldn't you just put your bishop on E4, uh, preventing the my opponent's king from being able to move the king? So he would have to push a pawn that my bishop would capture. So I would you basically, take. Yeah. yeah, it was a zoop yeah. swan. And yeah. uh, I didn't see it. And I'm like, oh my of goodness. Of course. Yeah. yeah. You didn't yeah. have time. I know that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I rode the elevator with him one time. He seemed like a really nice guy. But the, yeah, he, he nevertheless, nice. you, you, you point out, you have to point out what yeah. you overlooked. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and, and the funny thing, he was excited to see it. Like, he's like, wow, yeah. like, I just love chess. Uh, yeah. You know, because it was sort of an exciting thing, and I'm like, you know, games like this that like for beginners learning Zugzwang, it's you get that like, wow, that's I understand it, I see it now, right? And uh, yeah. you know, even players with some experience, like sometimes you just don't spot those things, and uh, I didn't in that moment, not. but it was it was kind of fun to right. be a part of of a game like that. Right, right, right. right. And, and, and so, so able, able, you know, the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. echoing. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear that, but um, yeah. maybe it's maybe it's my producer repeating me. Okay, stop it. All right. Um, what I was going to ask you is, well, first off, the U.S. Open is a special event because you get chess players from all over the country going to this tournament, and you get all people who love the game of chess, and you're just around an environment where there's a lot of energy. And, of course, it's competitive. Everybody wants to win their games and all that kind of stuff, but... You know, you run into in the hallway or in the elevator or or just going out to um, dinner afterwards. You're around chess players, and it's kind of like not everyday experience. You know, it's one of these once in a while you're around a bunch of chess players who love the game as much as you do, and it's yeah. a great experience. Yeah, it's it's a great experience to be around uh, a bunch of people like that. And I, I think that's it's part of my personality. I I really come to understand that. You know, if you go to the U.S. Open, you see a lot of like you know schmoozing and talking between different people, talking you know business and scholastics, and 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 I actually dislike all that. And uh, the people that know me that hung out with me, like I I didn't really participate in really any of that, and I didn't want to. I got a lot of the enjoyment out of like talking. There were so many players from Northern California there. And so I connected with them and their families with, you know, Viom and Omia, yeah. they were there and, uh, you know, yeah. Ella and Ethan Guo and their parents and hung out with them. Andrew Ballantyne. Lauren Goodkind, I got to meet her parents. Oh, oh, her and, and, oh yeah. there's, there's yeah. so much fun, the parents. And, yeah. and yeah, so yeah. I, I got my enjoyment out of hanging out with kind of like the people right not the yes. not the business not the politics um yeah and, and i had a lot of i had a lot of enjoyment in that and it's funny to see because there's a lot of like you know i mean you at the hotel there was like one restaurant and uh there were like clicks at like different tables like you know <laughs> the, the this business yeah. interest and that business and that business and you know that, that's essential and for some people that's sort of how they you know like make their moves but um yeah. You know, with that in that regard, I, I think I'm a little uh, more of a like a hermit uh, with that. But, yeah, but, well, but it suits me. You know, know. it's it, there are different things for different people. You know, and I I have um, gotten into and out of the the <laughs> governance and uh, you know all that kind of stuff. But what you're focused on, um, you know, that 
is, I think, the backbone of the U.S. Chess, the organization, clubs. Um, getting people that are uh, not going to be on the cover of Chess Live, they're not going to be president of the university, uh, the un un <laughs> sorry, the U.S. Chess. Um, they may not be interested in uh, titles, FIDE titles or things like that, but they love the game of chess and they want to play. And they want a place to go and play with other chess players. And that's the nature of, of, of a club, starting a club. Yeah. And and I mean, when I started in the, in the business, uh, so to speak, I, I started my own club organization. Basically, it was a business to do uh, teach chess in after school programs. And right. uh, I, I did that with the idea that sort of the heart of it, the philosophy of it, it was not to start a business. Oh, of course, I mean, that's what you end up doing. But you wanted to build a community that had an idea and a philosophy behind it that yes. players and parents could like rally around it. So, you know, my, my organization was called Castling Kids. And I remember, you know, we we had a team of kids from all the schools where we taught chess and we made shirts and, uh, you know, and on, and on the back of the shirt, on the back of the shirt, um, if I'd known I was going to get into this specific, I would have brought, brought one to show you. But on the yeah, shirt, yeah. I it said, uh, you know, we win as a team, we lose as a team. Right. And we just wanted to rally around the idea that, you know, win or lose, like we're always a team, like no, regardless, no matter what. And we support each other and we're there for each other. And I think approaching it in that way really sort of gave us a lot of buy in with parents, with the kids, with the schools. And uh, it, it really kind of made a cohesive unit team that I think we really stood out when we went to events all together. And, and you know, we, we wanted our kids to act right, be mature, not be, you know, uh, do things that, you know, inappropriate or annoying. And, you know, we really wanted to build that sense. Why, of, why were you looking at me when you said that? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then we've, I've carried that no, over to, the, to other organizations yeah. that I've been a part of and even the organization uh, that I'm a part of now. And, uh, you know, it's important. And that's why I think, you know, in chairing the clubs committee is, is approaching uh, developing new clubs, raising awareness of clubs with that in mind, because I think it's important to be very grassroots about it. Because one of the most beautiful things you can see is like, you know, a little club starting in a little town that, you know, may not have something to sort of foster and develop that sense of community within that community or, you know, elevate that community through chess and, and bringing chess yeah. and bringing people together. So really my focus uh, in, in this next year is to try to find ways uh, to bring new people into chess, not necessarily uh, to create affiliates or, or do that, but bring people together and make their communities better, sort of heighten their culture through chess um, because if that happens by just by nature, it's going to be good for us chess. So that, that's and I sort think, of the yeah, I, I think that, uh, organizations sometimes, and I'm not singling out any particular organization, but organizations sometimes lose sight of the mission, which is really to get people to play chess, to get chess, to be an integral part of society. Even if it's just an incremental change in society, if you, if you, it, the chess players, when I started out, it was uh, only because of Bobby Fischer was there any mainstream media. Uh, and now Netflix had this Queen's Gambit thing. So all, people are always asking me about that. You know, was that any good? Did you like it? You know, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, was it really like that in a tournament? And um, sometimes we get into the public, but most of the time, I can remember going to principals and offering my services for free to teach a chess class in, after school or in school, whatever. And they looked at me like I was an alien, right? you know, like I was made of green and had antenna and, and um, like, why would they? And then it was the parents that started to notice that if they had a chess program, the kids st started to achieve. And uh, then the parents put pressure on the administrators and they were some coming to me to ask me to do it instead of me going there and begging for an opportunity to teach kids chess. And I think it, we have learned it is a social good. And so if you have, have this going on in your community, 
it's good. It's and, good. and I think what's been happening lately too, you know, you know, as, as with any endeavor, you're going to, you can have good instructors and, and, you know, not so good oh, instructors. Sure. Uh, but I think there's a shift going on where people are approaching teaching chess uh, by bringing in the educational chess part of it, because there's a lot That's of right. research going on, uh, especially in the Chess and Education Commission with FIDE, that you can use chess as a learning tool to even teach other subjects. So, you know, it, it's learning chess as sort of a, a logic developing activity that, that uh, has value in, in other areas. And I think if you approach, especially with kids, not just, you know, teaching chess, the winning and the losing, you know, you're teaching the learning from the mistakes and you're teaching, you know, the logic, you know, uh, through chess. I think it just brings everything together in a way that that's good for the kids. The kids think it's fun. And, uh, and then the parents see the value in it. Yes. And it, that, that's one of the keys is the kids think they're at recess just playing, but right. they're learning skills that are directly transferable back into the classroom. Not the least of which is to sit still and think. <laughs> right. You know, this is not not something that every kid is born with. I certainly wasn't born with it. I was. I would. I like to. Um, uh, when I was around other people, I was always anxious or nervous and and uh, bouncing around. And so, the hardest thing for me in chess was to not make the first move that occurred to me. You know, yeah. uh, be, to sit still and think about what I was going to do because my opponent gets a turn too. It turns out, and so <laughs> right. that was. That was like, uh, okay, I have to, I have to plan. Now, what in our classrooms teach us how to plan? Chess teaches us how to plan and to postpone immediate gratification. And People actually, want to move their queens out. And and one of the great lessons that uh, you know I've done in classrooms uh, is where you're teaching them the idea of candidate moves, and uh, yes. you know, and I'll and I'll say, all right, you know, write down three options. And then, you know, the, the kids will write down three options out, and then I'll, and then I'll say, cause I'm, I'm already setting them up for what's, and then, you know, they have one move. Okay. All right. That's great that you have one move. Now, what is your opponent going to do after you have to you have to think of what your opponent's going to do after each of those moves. So, all right, do one more. Right. Then they do the next one. All right. Okay. Now go one more. Right. And, yeah. and it sort of like opens their eyes to the idea that, you know, not only do I have to think of multiple options but then i have to think of the consequences of those multiple options um, exactly and then it sort of like frees up their thinking to, uh, on another level yes and to visualize some uh, future position is not a skill that you normally are born with some of them are and they can become uh child's prodigies and savants but most people have to work on it it's like a muscle you have to develop it you have to exercise it and they get better at it and they can visualize more so you're 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 helping them develop a creative aspect of their mind that there aren't too many other activities that do it there right. are some music mathematics there but there are you know this is the correlation you bring when they finally when teachers figure out that chess does that same thing that a math class does that a, a music class does right. that it really does help them creative creatively and scientifically as well, because, you know, you can play 40 good moves and one bad one can spoil it, you know? So, you know, you have to be disciplined. Yeah, um, and one of the things I'm always saying is like, I would love to see chess appreciated on a level that is the same as like art and music. I mean, you go down the street and you see like a street performer, right? And, you know, you, you feel like it adds to the culture and vibrancy of the community. Uh, yes. Not not that long ago uh, on uh, Market Street in San Francisco, they used to have street chess, uh, you know, out on the streets, uh, you know, That's and, uh, you know, never mind some of the nefarious things that might have gone on during, during those street games. But, you know, it added to the culture and vibrancy of the community because, you know, it, it and it, it's sad that it does not have that yet that same status uh, because in Europe it does have an elevated status as as, as, as an endeavor in itself, like, like art music. Yes. And not only Europe, but obviously in Russia, you know, the, the bus driver might be a stronger player than a master. Yeah, exactly. In the United yes. States. Right. It, it's part of their culture and it's, it's appreciated. So a chess star there, even an American star, like I can remember grandmaster Denker going over to play uh, U S versus Russia match. And, 
and he was like a star you know he was he was uh like um, it, it would be like uh a movie star kind of adulation. Right. It's like, a, a, you know, Apollo Creed's in the area to fight Rocky Balboa, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's one of those things that other nations do appreciate it. Our nation does not. And I think it's beginning to change. It's not a popular activity yet, but it's so much more popular than it was when I started. And one of the things I see when I go to a scholastic event with kids they're kids of all nationalities, and there's boys and girls. And, and when know, I went to my first scholastic, it was all guys that looked like me. Yeah, and, and it, it, you know? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things that I've learned, not just in you know the organization I first started, but all the organizations I've been a part of after, is when you offer chess where they have to pay for it, um, you get you know a certain demographic. When you offer chess for free and anyone has access to it, you get something that more resembles <laughs> the United States, right? And uh, that really stands out because that really shows that as long as kids have access to do it, they will do it. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I fortunately work for an organization where, uh, you know, they raise a lot of money to provide free classes. Um, and uh, we've seen that in general. If, if you give access, they will play. And then it's just a, a matter of uh, creating pathways and avenues to continue the learning and the enthusiasm. Uh, but, you know, that's one of the beautiful things of chess is that, uh, you know, if, if it's open to anyone, anyone does indeed do it. Um, I remember. It doesn't few, matter what. Yeah. yeah I mean, there, oh, there was ahead. a, there was a school in the community I lived in, in San Jose a few years ago that was like 80% Latino. And, uh, you know, we brought a chess program to that school. And uh, I, I think there was some skepticism in the office at first, like, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, they've, you know, they've never, I've never seen them play chess. They haven't done anything. And over a couple of years, I mean, it, it became a highly organized chess club where, the parents were raising money for the chess club by making food and selling it. And, uh, you know, we brought them to, you know, championship events. They played as a team. And, you know, it, it, and it, it's something that became a pride of that school, right? So it's not, a, it's not about, you know, ethnicity. Um, it's just about access. And uh, when, yeah. when kids have the access to do it, um, you know, they they step up and do it and do it with enthusiasm. I know there's people in our area that are providing or try to provide, you know, free, you know, events and classes uh, so that anyone can access it. And uh, just all of that just helps the community be better. Yeah. And this is um, one of the things that the U.S. Chess Trust does is provide sets and boards to what we call Title I schools. So it's about giving the resources to those that can't afford to get them themselves and if you give them they use it and they play and they have fun and it's they think they're on recess but they're learning life lessons and it's a mm -hmm. wonderful thing and you know it doesn't matter what country you're from it doesn't matter what language you speak you all experience the same thing the joy of chess when you play it and i think that these things that you're talking about i want to bring it back to the clubs because isn't the does oh, let me ask the question does the uh, internet chess interfere with club organizations or how do you how do you marry the two uh actually not at all and actually if if anything i've experienced in the last year and a half that the internet is actually an opportunity to keep communities together i know uh in in our chess community uh we leverage the internet um as a way for people to stay together where they had no other option uh, we had the benefit where uh, we were able to keep them together through, you know, live broadcasts of our events that were on the internet and interacting with people in the chat. And, you know, it was all the yeah. familiar club players that, that were in yeah. the chat, watching the broadcast, interacting with each other. And uh, it, I mean, if there's anything that I'll probably be the most proud of and, you know, and hopefully I got a, a lot more years to go, but for certain, one of the things I'll be more, the most proud of is that, uh, during the pandemic, we really created a sense that, you know, the club was still there. The people were still there. We were visible. We were interactive with them in the chat, created events, um, you know, and, and I, I had geniuses helping me do that. Uh, you know, Judith well, started. The tip of the hat to you yeah. for doing that because I have complimented you in the past 
about how amazing the well you did that you kept the community together online and it, it was it was great to see and to witness yeah and you know and all. And uh, it's a good feeling, right? And uh, much more than I could have gotten of any good feeling as a player, at least for me, because I, was, I wasn't going to do anything <laughs> great as a player other other yeah. than, you know, make mistakes me that are too. useful in lessons. Right? <laughs> yes, right. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, in, in going through that year and a half, uh, you know, and some people said, you know, there's no way you can even do internet. I mean, it's impersonal and, and you know, and we didn't experience that. I, I mean, people came back to us. We interacted with them weekly. Um, and then when we reopened, it was like, you know, we're, we're back here with our brothers and sisters and our friends. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're right back, not feeling like we're starting over. Um, right. And yeah, it, it's just great to be a part of because it makes it feel like a family, like a community. And and that's sort of the idea. I think what's absent is people approaching the chess club like it's a family, like it's a community. And, and you know, may, maybe it sounds corny, but I feel like you have the greatest chance of success if you have th that sense of community, of organization, that, like, you, you're amongst people. And, uh, you know, because th there's another viewpoint that, oh, with clubs, you know, we should be competing against other clubs and, you know, it should be competition, which, you know, th and th there's room for that, of there's, course, right? There's an element. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But, but if we're really talking about defining what a club is and sort of setting the stage for anyone to be a part of it, you have to first, like, bring it at the grassroots level and say, you know, really it's about just bringing people together and, you know, creating an idea of what you represent. I know when we wrote the guide to successful chess club, like one of the parts is you have to know your members, like find out what they yes. want and give them that, right. Represent their values, right. And their culture. And uh, it, it's so important. I, I think that's one of the things when it, I mean, I've had so many people come to me and say, oh, I'm, I'm looking to start up a club or an organization. And there's even uh, organizations that call themselves clubs, but they're really like, they just hold events or, and, and that not that that's like a negative, but like the, the sense of club that I see, it's you represent the values of a community. You have like goals, you have sort of expectations of what you represent. And uh, but just like like any family would do that, just any community would do that, and um, so that's it. I'm I, very very happy to hear you say those things. I I believe in them, just as just like you do, and um, to communicate that to others, to hear people, to hear you say that out loud is a very useful thing. And I appreciate you being on the show to, to say that. Um, the idea of clubs can take on a community aspect and i think that that has been it's not just about i can have people come over my house and play blitz all afternoon and it's not really the same it's just me inviting my friends and what you want to do is to have stronger players um, help players that are almost as strong but not quite as and they could help others that are almost as good as they but not quite and you can trickle down knowledge of the game and the culture and the history of the game which is generally unappreciated um yes. by the people that I, I i speak to um and those that that do appreciate it that they're a treasure trove to have around and reach out you know make them feel like they are special the it, people it, that have that knowledge it's funny you say that because i had a conversation with a colleague of mine paul whitehead and uh, we were debating whether Shout out to paul. We're debating. I'm like, it seems like a lot of the kids today, especially the stronger kids, don't ha really have an appreciation or interest in like the history of chess. And like, why is that? Right? It's like, you know, a lot of the kids are more interested in just getting stronger and not yeah. learning. I mean, and, you know, from their point of view, they're saying, okay, I can learn about uh, the history of the people's tournament and everything that went on and, you know, but like, well, how's that gonna make me a better player? Right. And, uh, I think that needs to be addressed because you have to come up with a good answer for that. Right. Yeah. Cause yeah. the difference I see from when I started out 
is the computers, the engines, you know, they, they have the ability to get stronger in a ways that I could not. I didn't have that engine. And I, there weren't such a thing as chess coaches or, you know, people that I, my dad could pay to teach me chess. Um, that wasn't the thing either. So what we did was we learned from books and we learned about the past. And so we all grew up with this cultural appreciation of the past. And then they appreciate the organizers, the people that go out and run the tournaments and put on a, a place for you to play. You know, um, typically they're the bad guy because they're the, the people that tell you to shh or something like that when you're right. making noise or, but you know, um, you, you really ought to go up and thank them for doing it, giving you a place to play. And so just being more polite, which is not necessarily something that comes naturally to a chess player. They're competitive by nature. But, you know, being polite and appreciative that, you, you know, people that came before you that ran the, the peoples like Mike Goodall ran the peoples for right. decades. And, uh, you know, like who said he who said he had to? Nobody. He just said, right. you know, this is a good tradition and I want to keep it going. So I'm going to step up to the plate and do it. And there's a lot of history people of people that, that did it because like there was no one else to do it. And the one thing they did exactly. not want to see is something not happen because there was no one to do it. Right. And, um, That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and I mean, one of the things in, in, in another conversation I've had, you know, with, with people around me is, you know, we, we have some eminent historians. I mean, I just, uh, had a coffee with John Donaldson, uh, on yeah. Wednesday. And, you yeah. know, we were talking for a couple of hours, and, you know, he, he had some, some stories and, you know, Elliot Winslow's always a great, uh, great story. Oh, and, yeah. you know, Carrie, yeah. you know, Carrie, Carrie Lawless, but there's yeah. actually not that younger person around that has the interest and regularly writes in the Bay area, at least that I've seen about California his chess history or about what's going on currently and things of that, it'd be great if we were able to identify or support someone that is willing to write and think about, because there's also a whole new way to think and write about things now um, in terms of what you see and how you see it. So I'm making a note. That's a really good point. Where are the young chess historians? Yeah, where are the writers, yeah. right? And, and maybe they're out there and they just have, oh, of course. They don't have the yeah. forum to do it, right? And, they may not have the form to do it and they, they may be interested in the, like the computers give a plus minus kind of evaluation of a yeah. move. And some of the analysis I see is based on that. But you know, what about the thought process? You know, that those are the things that intrigued me when I was going up like a, right. an annotation that included what was going on in the guy's mind, you right. know? He's yeah, up it, against Capablanca, Capablanca never loses. And I've got a position that I, I think I, I'm winning but I don't trust it because it's Capablanca. And then I thought, well, Capablanca, he, well, you know, he's human too. And I played the sacrifice and I won. You know, it right, was like, right. that, that was so inspiring. And, and, and I'll tell you something that is sort of why I truly love the club player, like the average club player. So uh, I was on a broadcast on Tuesday night where Nick DeFermian, three-time U.S. champion, and I were watching a game be the Nick. between two 1,800 strength players. And the position was absolutely fascinating. It was a king and two rooks and like four pawns against a king, rook, and three minor pieces with one pawn. And you literally didn't know what was going to happen. And not only did you not know what was going to happen, because Nick barely knew what was going to happen. And he's a grandmaster. Right. right. We're, we're right. watching it and we're like, okay, if Nick is not 100% sure what's going to happen, you got these two 1,800 players trying to figure out what's going to happen. And right. you know it's going to be gold because yeah. there could be a complete blunder on the next move or you might see the most brilliant thing ever. And we followed that game online on the broadcast for, you know, uh -huh. two hours, two and a half hours. Uh -huh. And it, that is club level chess, like at its finest. It's not because it's the highest quality, but it's because no. two people trying to give it their all with their limited capabilities to give it their all. Absolutely. And there's drama in that. And it's fascinating. And it can be beautiful to watch. And I think that, you know, the, I play chess now. I just want an interesting position. 
you know, I'm not, I used to be so in, involved in my rating and what, you know, winning and losing and all of that. But now I just want a position that doesn't bore me. You know, if I, if I get bored with the position, I'm almost inevitably going to lose because I'm just not into it. But if it's a fascinating position, I'm, I'm, all in my concentration is not wavering and uh, this is what can be produced at any level and those two 1800 players are having more fun than Kasparov and Karpov had when they were butting each other's heads again for the real world championship and, I mean and that's the, the that's the thing that you want to emphasize at the club level and the thing even like the 1200 player can two 1200 players can find themselves in that position and they are just trying to figure it out and, and put everything they have into it that's and it. and it, that's just beautiful to watch. I mean, there, there's and beauty and passion yeah. in that chaos. It's just, it's just fantastic. Yeah. And we, we're too often we're turning up our nose at the quality of the play. But really what you want to focus on is that at any moment, the tide can turn in those right. games. Right. So, and, you know, and we were you, expecting that to happen several times. And that, yeah. it's exciting. And, you know, it's like we're trying yeah, to watch when is the – exactly. You know, when, when is it going to yeah. go off, right? And uh, and this is a three-time U.S. champion, grandmaster, being excited watching two 1,800 players play. Yeah, you know, we, did, we didn't and, even take our break. We were supposed to take a break, yeah. and we said, yeah, forget <laughs> this. Uh, this is more exciting. And then when the well, game was it, over, it, I went out and thanked them. It was like, that was, that was beautiful. Yeah. Good for you, because that acknowledgement is important, too. I really think that that is the, uh, a club director that that's part of your job too, not just providing the place to play, but to give them some encouragement, you know, tell them to keep coming back. You'll get them next time. Something like that. That's, yeah. that's just part of the job. It's part of the service that you provide. And I think that, um, you know, you're an excellent example of it. Judith is an excellent example of it. I think there are many excellent examples across the country and your job as the committee chair is to like, not not one you've already produced a pamphlet so people don't have to reinvent the wheel but get them to share each other's ideas like what works what doesn't work and absolutely oh this didn't work for me but oh it worked for you how do you make it work and you know right. that kind of conversation right so absolutely. i really appreciate you coming on to the show um is there any question that i have forgotten to ask you that you wanted to talk about something that um, I overlooked because I was talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just appreciate you having me on and, and talk about clubs and the value of clubs because at the end of the day, I, I think there can be a renaissance of chess clubs in the United States. And I just think the average everyday person just needs a little boost and uh, information about how to start that club and hopefully over the next year, we will be able to work with the USCF to provide people with the resources to just get a club going and to offer them support. And the other thing that I would say in closing, Abel, is that in my day, it was easier to get free space to play. That's become that's more challenge. of a challenge. Yeah. That's a challenge. And um, But that's where something like uh, your role in, in US Chess, you know, maybe you could help solve that it's it's a like the eat foundation it's a 501c3 charity maybe there's a way to leverage those because yeah. sometimes the community is open to a 501c3 when it's closed right to a for-profit enterprise or identifying so, relationships where it exactly. can have some kind of mutual benefit for space right mm -hmm. right things like that to leverage and to cooperate as install a spirit of collaboration and cooperation rather than competition this is the other thing that i think we can, we can do and i think you're an excellent example of that as well so thank, thank you, you again for joining me and thank i'm going to take us out now and take you backstage and uh uh just want to tip of the hat to the work you're doing thank you very much thanks for thanks able okay that was able to him and and um, i'm going to just change my background a little bit here to uh make it, you know, because when I'm talking just myself, I want a, a different screen, but I, I can't seem to make that work. So anyways, I'm gonna talk with this screen. Um, there are some things that I want to talk about the Eid Foundation by, by uh, way of saying that you can support us by going to our YouTube channel as well as our, our website. Now it's on across the bottom of your screen is the YouTube channel. You can see all of the chess files previous videos, you can subscribe, which would help the Chess Foundation uh, 
get more uh, allies in the attempt to reach out to the business community to support the chess community, which is in all of our best interests. And the Foundation is a 501c3. Any donations that you you can make to us, it doesn't go to me, it doesn't go to the, our board. All of our board members are, are volunteers. It goes directly to the people that need help. So help us help them. And you'll be doing everyone a great service by doing those types of things for chess. And it's to build communities through chess. That's the, I was trying to pick up the picture that says that, because that's the motto of the foundation. That's the elevator pitch I use. It build communities through chess. And sometimes people don't know what I mean, but when you see these kids playing chess, you know, and the parents looking at them play chess, you know what it means to build a community and how it can be an important contribution to wherever you live, whatever country you are, you live in, whatever language you speak, it just doesn't matter. So um, with that, I will say the chess files, the answers are out there. And we bring in guests to tell you what the answers are, because I don't know. And we do it every Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern. And so I hope that you will tune in in the future and subscribe. Just go to YouTube, do a channel search on Need Foundation, and subscribe. The more subscribers I have, the more I can do for others. So thanks very much. And hopefully you will see me next Friday.